Let's talk about what the two of you are doing today. I mean, sadly, when you look at how violent our society is, there is no shortage of stories to tell. And here Over we are, room. my show, up, you know, bumping up on our 300th episode, and, 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 and we're digging into cold cases now that are 30 and 40 years old are now just being solved. I'm curious what you use as your criteria to select which bad guy you're going to hunt for. Every Toughest day. question. All the years that I did America's Most Wanted, we turned down between 200 and 250 cases every week. Caught 17 guys off the FBI's 10 most wanted, so the FBI wanted only us to do FBI cases. The marshals have a 15 most wanted. I made the, the meeting that most of the police agencies in the United States are less than 10 men or women, 70% of them. I said, I'm gonna do I'm going to do small town cases. They don't have the detectives to go. So we had the criteria. Can we catch this guy? Is he possible to catch? We got to get two or three missing children. We're going to do two missing children. Cal will be in charge of that. And what is the goal of each episode? It's to catch whoever we can catch. It's to get the public. We look at them. We say, this guy catchable. Where do you think, John? I think he's in Mexico. I think this guy might have gone to Canada. The hardest thing is to turn these people down. Callahan always says it. I watched my parents heartbroken for 27 years. It took me 27 years to get those damn Hollywood police, a brand new young chief, gave me the files because Adam's case was bungled so badly. And when I got those files after 27 years, I had a retired homicide detective, Joe Matthews, pro bono, and a retired prosecutor who never lost a death penalty case, Kelly Hancock, pro bono, solved Adam's case in one month. The Hollywood police kept those files closed because they missed so many pieces of, and made, because Otis Tool, Adam's murder, was in the radar in 1984 and they had to cut him loose because they lost the bloody carpet in his car where he decapitated Adam. It was a nightmare. So, so Cal knows and I know what it's like you know, to wait for that justice. So the telling these people I can't do it is horrible because they'll go, John, you're the court of last resort. You're the guy who catches the impossible catches and we need you to do this. And I say, I can't, I can't, I'm so overwhelmed. So is the role that you want the public to play in your new show in pursuit the same as it was in America's Most Wanted? You want as many eyes and ears on a we're, like you did tonight. We're, we're trying to make know what the, the world, bad guy looks like. We're trying to make the world a real small place for these bad guys. Trying to shine that white hot spotlight on them. Get their picture out in front of as many eyeballs as possible. We know at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the most important tool when it comes to the recovery of a missing child is a photo of that child, and it goes the same with these perps. Uh, getting and eyeballs. And the speed at which you can get that photo out to the public. And, it, and it's not just the show; it's the social media that's going to be behind the show as well. Big that's component. Gonna, that's going to drive it, and we're lowering the threshold for tips. The tips are incredible from the public. Uh, the public is oftentimes law enforcement's most important tool. What Even do you mean lowering the threshold? Because tips I know online. oftentimes in our show the, the cops will get like 400 really tips come in and maybe making, one half of one tip. Lowering the threshold means making it easy for them. So having a hotline that's staffed with operators that aren't cops, that are trained operators, that aren't going to ask your name, you can remain anonymous. We have that bond of trust with the public. Uh, and having tips online. Not everybody wants to call, uh, call a phone number. Uh, we have this new generation of young people who are tech savvy. We've got InPursuitTips.com where they can go to and leave a tip anonymously there. So really just trying to make it as easy as possible to get these tips, even as insignificant as a tip may be, it can be the key that unlocks the door to justice. No, without and, a, without and, a doubt. Don't you find that over time, sometimes family members who are terrified of coming forward, who may know something, as time passes, perhaps even the perpetrator might be sick, they're more willing when they feel that their safety is they're, ensured to come forward with Two things. Tip. They're more willing when they see the segment and the dirtbag told his mother that I stole five pounds of pot and the cops are chasing me. That's why I'm hiding out. She looks at the show and goes, oh, my God, he's a child molester. He's, I had 35 families turn in their sons and cousins, et cetera, on America's Most Wanted. But my deal, and I have the same deal with Henry Schleif, who is the reason I've come out of retirement. I've known this man for 30 years. He's made Discovery ID so, so such a wonderful place for you and a place for me. Um, my bond of trust was, and I had it in my contract with Fox, I'm never going to show the picture of a woman's face if she doesn't want us to. I will never show the face of a child. Don't let that creepy, lazy stepfather and mother put a 13-year-old child on, so, on the media. I'm not going to show the faces. I'm not leaving it up to the parents to make the decision. 
I pick the cases, no tabloid cases, and people don't want to call the cops. They don't want that assistant DA to knock on the door and say, we told you we could protect you, but I need you at the trial. No, people don't want to be, they don't want to be murdered. They don't, they want to turn in Cousin Julio, the gangbanger, but they don't want Cousin Julio because the defense attorneys get all that information and give it. I, I found a girl, uh, is sex trafficked in Seattle, 15 year old girl, was an MS-13. They sex traffic girls, that horrible Nicaraguan gangbangers. He ordered her murder from the from jail because the defense attorney found out what halfway house she was in, and the cops didn't protect her, so they killed the witness. So, so I know that people want to do the right thing. I figured that out way back trying to solve Adam's case, asking people for help. If you show them how to do it and you protect them, and I have hotline operators that are better than any cop in the country. They know how to weed through the bullshit. They know when, it, they're, they're well trained. And, and haven't you found over the years, because the, the crime genre has grown in popularity, you know, with scripted shows and shows like ours, where we're, we're yeah. telling true crime stories, uh, that they're very savvy about investigations. I, got, I would say the average person who no. watches ID, who we would call one of our ID addicts, mm -hmm. really understand investigative tools. And, Double edged sword. Yeah. Much more sophisticated, but shows like NCIS and everything have compromised juries so badly and prosecutors have lost their guts because now that jury will sit there or that prosecutor will say, do we have DNA? Do we have a smoking gun? Do we have, you are a prosecutor, do we have video? And the juries will go, where is that? 90% of cases are still on circumstantial evidence. So you've got DAs that are worrying about their track record, they're up for election, they'll tell cops, I can't do this case because there's no DNA. And these juries expect it. They expect DNA, they think they're all amateur sleuths. sleuths. And that, it's a double-edged sword, but they have gotten more sophisticated. And I have a huge following in, 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 on Facebook. The first time we put up a website on America's Most Wanted when the internet came to be, I caught 40 guys that year all over the country it's and amazing. all over the world. I caught guys in 45 countries. So I, I believe in the public that 99% of the people in the world are just like us. They wanna feed their families, get their kids a better college, better education than they had. And there's a huge evil manipulative population out there. So I say to people, trust me, and we'll go find that dirt bag. You know what amazes me about you? And, and I, I feel like I can say with this with confidence after spending so many time, so much time with families over the last 10 years who've endured such deep losses. And, 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 and grief has, as you well know, a different impact on every individual. The fact that out of the horror of what you and your wife went through, that you were able to deep dig deep, deep inside of you and to come out of your experience with a commitment to help protect families sitting here today and prevent a tragedy that happened to your family and, and, and to your son from happening to them, which, which has caused you to go to Washington, D.C. and fight for legislation. I, I know you had those days where you couldn't get out of bed, but the I... fact that you've taken that rage and pivoted it and, and made such a great contribution to, I give to, that to us all. I really believe it. I appreciate you saying that, but I give the credit to my wife because when Adam was murdered, I had I, I had the American dream. I went to private school. I had my own company and three partners. I was building a $26 million hotel on Paradise Island. I lived in a beautiful house in Hollywood, Florida. I had a beautiful wife, and I had a beautiful six-year-old son. So when he was kidnapped, we did things that... My partners and I designed the first missing child poster, had Eastern Airlines distribute it. When ABC and NBC and CBS turned me down to go on television, I found the mayor of Orlando, whose college roommate was David Hartman, and David Hartman put Revee and I on television. Adam wasn't the first missing child, but we did things that were never done before. But when he was found dead, I, I spiraled into hell. They, the post office delivered 40,000 pieces of mail to our garage. People from all over the country who said, my child is missing, my ex-husband stole my child, my drug-addicted wife didn't get the child in divorce, my kid's a runaway, how do we get help? Reve answered every single question, and she was thinking about starting a center somewhere because the FBI refused to help us, there were no Amber Alerts, etc. I, like typical Irish 
guy that I am, a box in college, I was in the garage trying to figure out how to kill Adam's murder. If I could find him, I was going <clears> to <throat> kill him. And I, I trust me. So, and you I have no idea how many people I interview on my show. Yep. Family members say the same thing. Okay, you know, if they didn't have me restrained. Yep. When that and guy I lost is arrested, I'm thirty pounds. I only weigh 160 pounds. I lost 30 pounds, and I was suicidal. I kept saying, I can't stand this pain. I need to get off this planet. So when they wouldn't give me Adam's skull, I called up the Broward County Medical Examiner, Ronald Wright. He was the real CSI guy. He was a lawyer. He'd done Elvis's autopsy. He ran the morgue up in Broward County, and he was an advocate for unidentified dead. And I said, we had a bullshit memorial. My cousin's a monsignor. He couldn't get through it. Everybody's devastated. I can't function. And I said, I'm coming up to get Adam Scully. He says, come at 11 o'clock at night. I do my best work. He says, by the way, I have four little girls up here in the morgue that were killed at different times in Fort Lauderdale. 13 to 16 years old. They're runaways. Lauderdale's the capital of East Coast runaways, LA's West Coast. And I said, so why have you got them in the cooler up there? And he says, I'm doing autopsies. Florida law says I must bury them in six months. There is no unidentified dead file, John. We bury kids all over this country. He said, did you call every coroner in the, in, in the state of Florida? And I went, what are you talking about? We put a man on the moon. I've got to call coroners to find out if Adam's body's in Jacksonville. And this was during the search. This is how I met him. So I go up there at 11 o'clock. I have this rapport with him. He looks like Ichabod Crane. He comes out and I said, I'm taking that skull with me. I'm taking that skull. Tomorrow I'm going to have a funeral parlor come up and take that skull. And he says, you look like hell. He said, I heard you, you're, trying to, you're trying to leave this planet. And I said, how, how would you know that? He says, you, you have friends that are very worried about you. And I said, do not give me any lecture. I want to know why you can do these autopsies on these kids. Why you still have them in the cooler up here. And he goes, and who do you believe in? How do you do this? He said, I work so hard because I believe in the death penalty. He said, I didn't. I said, well, I was never a death penalty advocate. I was a child of the 60s. And I said, why? He says, because when you kill a child, you have crossed a barrier that there's no turning back. He said, I want to see him electrocuted, even though it costs $20 million in 20 years. And they can come back as a butterfly or a dolphin or whatever, but they need to be off this planet. I said, good, I agree with that. And I said, what do you believe in? He says, I don't know. I believe in a higher power. And he said, I don't know whether that's Muslim, Buddhist, Jewish, Catholic, whatever it is, but I exercise my free will. And the guy who killed Adam, and it will be, you will know it is a serial predator. He said, I would bet it's a serial mobile pedophile. He says, they exercise their free will to do whatever they want. They'll have rape, plunder, sociopaths. They'll, you know, they'd have sex with a dog, a child, you know, whatever it is. And he said, I put them on death row. I honor those kids. And he said, you know, there's a missing children's bill. What you're complaining that the FBI didn't enter Adam in the NCIC. There's millions of stolen boats, planes, and cars and a race horse, and you wouldn't enter your son. You badgered and fought. He said, Paula Hawkins, who's now dead, one of the first women in Congress, has put that bill in, bill in play, and the FBI opposes it in and the, and the marshals. And I said, what the hell is that? He said, why don't you saddle up? I heard you say it all the time. You're a horse guy, big horse guy. Why don't you saddle up and make sure Adam didn't die in vain? And if you killed yourself, you'd be a coward. Your whole family would be devastated. I went, you have no right to call me a coward. He said, done. Get off your ass, put your big boy pants on, and get out there and do something. That changed my whole life. I was in really bad shape. So I started to go to Washington. Freve started the center. And my new focus was the FBI. So my new enemy was the FBI. And Ronald Reagan helped us get that bill passed. The FBI testified against me. They went, we don't want to get in the child business. They're all runaways. Adam wasn't a runaway. He was six years old. My wife brought him to private school every day and picked him up. She's the best mother in the world. She turned her head one minute and Otis Tool grabbed him because they ordered him out of the store. It's the worst story. These guys, it took me 27 years to find out that when Adam walked in that store with his mother, video games were brand new that week. <clears throat> two black boys, 13, 14 here, two white boys from Argentina. Adam says, can I watch this video game, Mom? We called him the little gentleman. He was so, just a wonderful little boy. Traveled the world with us. And she said, I'm going from here to there and pay for this lamp. She turned around, he was gone. What we never knew for 27 years was the boys got in an argument, a 17-year-old part-time security guard, because Sears wouldn't pay full-time. 
wouldn't pay any benefits. The girl had had an abortion the day before. She came upon these boys. She went, you white boys out this garden door, you black boys out this door. Otis Tool was surfing in the toy department. He followed Adam out. There was Adam crying outside the store. When Reve turned around and Adam wasn't there, she asked the clerk, what, how do I do? She went to customer service. They wouldn't broadcast Adam's name. No one told her. The head of security told that girl, do not tell the Hollywood police you ordered Adam out of here. Oh. We'll be in a huge lawsuit. Valuable time was lost. That girl was joint, became an emergency room nurse for all those years out of guilt. And when those two guys got a hold of the files, they tracked her down. She said, I've carried this burden with me my whole life. We never told the police how Adam got ordered out of that store. So anyway, but thank we went on to battle. We, well, we, thank, we saddled up. God we saddled up. And you know. you had better angels out there who saw your strength.